Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Perspective. In the last couple of days, uh, there are some terms that I think have gone through everyone's heads. Freedom of expression, right to protest, due process of law, mob justice. Whichever way you look at it, what has transpired in the last three, four days? The question right now before us is whether due process of law can be influenced, whether right to protest is completely um, unilateral, um, does not have any bar on it, is not uh, something that uh, is absolute. And where does the state and its dignity come in? Where does uh, the due process of law and the fact that it cannot be and should not be influenced by outside consideration come into play. I want to talk about that, uh, considering what's happened as, uh, in uh, the capital, around uh, the provinces, if we look at KP, if we look at Punjab, if we look at Balochistan, the overall situation and what is the root cause of it. Where does the due process of law come and where does the question that it must be absolute um, and not be tempered with come. I want to talk about that in the larger interest. We've also seen political parties come out. We've also seen the Prime Minister talk about a justice that clearly uh, is angling towards a particular side. Does the government at this time have any option when it chooses to investigate charges? Does the court have option when it chooses to adjudicate and can it and should it then show its own um, angling towards a particular side? All of those are questions today for us. Let's talk about all of that. I have with me Barrister Yasser Latif, who's a legal expert. Thank you for being with us. We have with us Barrister Safiullah Ghwari, who's a political analyst also, another lawyer. Thank you for being with us today. And we have with us Zulfikar Ali Badr from the PPP. Thank you for joining us. Right. Um, Yasir, like I said, uh, overall, as far as the last few days are concerned, we have before us, you know, the questions are the same. When we look at the freedom of expression, we look at the right of protest, all of those things are right before us. But where does your right to protest end and where does your freedom of expression end and where does the respect dignity of state institutions, the respect dignity of lives, of property, personal property come in? And where does the concept of mob justice come in to sway any particular outcome in any particular legal uh, case, in your opinion? Well, um, as far as the right to peaceful assembly is concerned, hmm. And that is a right given under Article 16 of the Constitution. Hmm. It is subject to it being peaceful. It is subject to it being non-violent and constitutional. Once it ceases to be that, it ends up being unconstitutional. And that's where you have to draw the line. What we've seen happening since May 9th uh, is not just unconstitutional. It is outright illegal. Hmm. Uh, and I, I feel that perhaps now, you know, there has to be some kind of debate nationally about whether you are going to allow protests which become almost militant rebellions. I think that that's something that uh, would have to be addressed by the courts ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, this should not go unpunished. I think uh, what we have is a situation, a very dangerous situation, because what you're going to have in the future are similar actions by other parties, including this one for that matter. We so have before us the question now that where does your street power become incremental to uh, the due process of law. I want to go to uh, Safiullah with this. Safiullah, do you, you know, the fact that now, you know, the pivotal role at this time seems to be of your street power, which should certainly, you know, be important in a parliamentary democracy where you have to cast your vote. But is it going to then translate into mob justice where we are going to have people trying to prove who has more power, who has more political power, not just political, I think street power. Yeah. And when it comes down to it, 
if when it's really a, you know a fight between who has more, it's not necessarily true that you know it it might be not the side that we are uh, looking at. Tariq Taliban probably has the most. You know, they could they could probably uh, make the most violent protests if they had to. Hmm. Uh, you know, if allow them, tell them to come out and show uh, what they want for a, a Sharia uh, system in Pakistan, and I'm sure they'll they'll conduct violence unlike anyone has ever seen before. Hmm. That's besides the point. You asked a very interesting question earlier about where does uh, the right to express yourself freely end and where does the right of the state uh, hmm. to conduct peaceful assembly begin. Hmm. And there's a very old English adage which came to my mind. Hmm. Uh, it says that you have the right to swing your stick, but your right to swing your stick ends where my nose begins. And by my nose, obviously, I mean where hmm. violence to me by and right. any, any harm to me hmm. starts. Hmm. And we have already seen that that has been crossed. Uh, however, I think a lot more uh, concerning is the role of the Supreme Court. And that is something that I really want to con uh, talk about here. So the Supreme Court, by declaring that the arrests were illegal, uh, a declaration that was passed after the ISPR had said that they were legal, mm. after the High Court had said that they were legal, and after they had said they were legal, subsequent to which protests took place. Mm. The Supreme Court, by, by saying that the arrests were illegal, has given justification to those protests. Has in essence, because has a, it uh, because the the right to protest against something that is illegal mm. is a basic right. And if you are protesting against something illegal, you are mm. doing something right. You are doing something in the aid of law. Mm. And so, by doing so, the Supreme Court has sanctified these protests. Mm. And it will now only be a matter of time before these protesters come out as heroes, because that's what the law now says that they they were pro they were protesting against something that was essentially, by its very nature, void of an issue mm. and illegal. Mm. And the fact that the Supreme Court did not pay attention to that only paid lip service along the lines that you know, mm. if Imran Khan, if you feel like it's appropriate, you should condemn it. And I don't know, he just maybe condemned it in the passing. First, I think I remember him saying that. He did not know about it after he was told that you no know, something happened. He he said that it should not have happened. And even when Justice Atar Minalla tried to bring the matter to Imran Khan, saying that as a leader it is your responsibility to condemn these, hmm. the Chief Justice snubbed him and said that uh, this is not the case. The case is whether the warrants were legal or illegal. Hmm. And he carried on with it. And that same line of reasoning has today been adopted by the Islamabad High Court. So what, what we have now seen is that if an I act want to go and talk more <coughs> about also what happened today in court in, in terms of the blanket, it, it, I mean, if, if the terminology, I don't know if it's correct or not, but this blanket uh, um, bail that has been granted in numerous cases uh, to the former prime minister himself. I'll, I'll come back to you. I'm going to go to Zulfiqar Sahib. Zulfiqar Sahib, are you, you know, now we're looking at the PDM now saying, Malana Sahib just said that there's going to be protesters outside Supreme Court who are going to collect to, uh, you know, of course, show your solidarity, um, peaceful protests he's talking about. But is this is also, is it becoming, is, is it going to, sh I mean, of course, you know, how many people can be amassed? Is it is it becoming like, a, you know, you can, can you do more? Can we do more? Is it becoming that kind of a competition? Because the precedent here, the, the violence we've seen in the last couple of days is certainly there. And then the decision that has come after that, that precedent is certainly in the field now. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you very much for inviting me to your show. The question is very pertinent. Actually, um, my Mr. point Kansab, of view uh, is... I think that you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Gee, I, I can't hear you. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you. Right, let me... That Bismillah me rahman rahim And then we'll come back to you. Gee, um, Yasir, but... But, you know, like I said, is it going to, in terms of the precedent that na that's now in the field, in the political arena also, you know, even if we look at it, you know, minus what the le legality of this is, if you look at the political arena and, and, you know, many years from now, even when we look back, this is giving a kind of uh, uh, legitimacy to street power, is it not? In your it opinion? is absolutely doing that. And I think uh, the problem with this is what we, and like, like Barrister Safiullah said, uh, what, what the Supreme Court has done has sanctified these protests and has said that this is what you can do in order to achieve your goals legitimately in mm -hmm. the state. So I think that is going to be a big problem in the future. What we are going to have uh, are other such parties, groups etc and there wouldn't be, this would be such a precedent for them even you know even if, if we look at you know what was going on over the last 
10 years or so or, or 9 years, we've seen dharna being cited as this catch-all. Mm. And that is precisely what's going to happen with this. Now tomorrow when, when say uh, a, a militant outfit or, or a religious extremist outfit comes to Islamabad and does the same thing, they're going to have this excuse and mm. they're going to have a Supreme Court judgment <laughs> Almost right. Mm. It's not a judgment yet, but it might as well be. Mm. So I think that that this is this is what has happened. It, the Supreme Court has sanctified this protest, violent protest, street power, um, and and mob violence. And then uh, you know the fact that of course this was in pursuance of a case which was uh, you know which is uh, the Al Qaeda Trust case. I want to come and talk about that also. The question of investigation, the question of course uh, as uh, you know we've also had uh, Bilawal Bhutto Saddari talk about NAB law and how you know there, there has been uh, of course amendment in NAB law to now include 14 day demand which was earlier I think I believe 90, 90 days. 90 days. Um, this is going to create in your opinion uh, you know the, the case itself it has to be investigated right. And let me go to um, Safiola with this. Safiola, overall, how what is what is the case on merits in your opinion? I mean, if if we look at the investigation itself, so what, what does it I really boil down to? I have not read, of course, the, mm. the the reference that is being prepared or the investigation report. Mm. I am only aware of um, statements that NAB has made on the on the matter, and there uh, these these things that have been said seem to make it a very open and shut in a very clear case. So, mm. Malik Riaz was uh, accused of money laundering 190 million pounds mm. to the UK, which was cost, uh, which was caught by the NCA, the National Crime Agency. Mm. Malik Riaz was subsequently barred from entering the UK. He has been blacklisted by the UK. The UK government has clearly stated that this was a serious case of money laundering, and uh, that money was returned to the government of Pakistan. Now, when the money was returned to the government of Pakistan, at that, that point of time, Imran Khan was the prime minister. Imran Khan took the money, put it in, to, uh, which was returned to the Supreme Court of Pakistan, took mm. the money from the Supreme Court and returned it to Malik Riaz. Okay. In, a, in a very simple transaction, an agreement was uh, f uh, signed with Malik Riaz. This agreement, w um, I, I even know the name of Malik Riaz's law firm, Kingsley Naples, mm. which had confidentiality clauses. We know this because Malik Riaz is now suing the government of Pakistan in London mm. for uh, disclosing this agreement. Okay. And this agreement was signed, which stated that Malik Riaz would be given his money back as if it's his money, you know, this is Pakistan's money. It was just given back to him and in and Imran Khan, and this was all done on sealed envelopes. Nobody knows what it, what happened. Mm. We do know partly from statements given by Shahzad Akbar, who was mm. the minister for recovery of these kind mm. of monies, that this is what happened. Part of part of this information comes directly from a PTI minister. But the question is, you know, whether whatever whatever the nitty gritties of this case, and of course, you know, investigation will happen. Yeah. Um, uh, the point is that that investigation for that to happen, due process of law has of to course. happen, and, so and the steps of it has so to take yeah, place. Of course. So in in that in, uh, further onwards, NAB then sent two call-up notices to Imran Khan. Mm. In both call-up notices, Imran Khan did not go. It mm. said he sent written replies, mm. something along the lines that you know whatever questions you have, mm. you can ask me by in writing. I will return to them in writing. That's fine, you know mm. uh, that happens and mm. that can happen. But then NAB also retains mm. the power to arrest and call a person in for uh, further mm. investigation. Mm. Now, why this is important is because whilst Imran Khan did this, he then took. 54 acres of land in the name of Al Qadir Trust, uh, mm. a trust that he made in which there are only two directors, himself and his wife, Bushra Bibi. And uh, the two other names are often mm. taken, but those directors have now left uh, left the Al Qadir Trust in a couple mm. of months, so I won't mm. take their names. Mm. So and, and it's very clear that there was a quid pro quo. There's mm. also talk of getting 150 canals in Banigala. There's also talk of getting a five carat diamond. Mm. I don't know what the value of five mm. carat diamond is. But the point are. is, you know, that so those <coughs> allegations, whatever they are, the government or, or NAB in this case has been investigating those. NAB has been investigating, and sending mm -hmm. call-up notices. And so, I, you know, once again, I, I can only speak from personal experience. I've dealt with a lot of NAB cases. This is... Uh, this was this was very very lenient of NAB the way they uh, they proceeded with this entire matter. Right, I want to come to that. I want to come to the proceedings of NAB as well. But let me go to Zulfikar Sab. Zulfikar Sab, can you hear me now? Hey, Zulfikar yeah. Sab. Zulfikar Sab, your you know like yes, I, I said, can. this I is can. as far as amassing power is concerned, as far as showing street power is concerned. Now, as far as you know, if you if the Mulana Sab has said that there is going to be a sit-in in front of the Supreme Court. 
why does why why at this time has there been a strategy towards that in your opinion what is what is the pdm now say exactly bismillah rahman rahim thank you very much maruf for inviting me to your show uh, our party and our leadership is very clear about what we want to do in politics we respect mm -hmm. each other's perspective and ppp has a part is not a part of pdm and ally of pdm so when pdm decides anything we respect that but our party has not given a clear uh, policy whether we are going to be a part of this uh, sit, in. sit in or not hmm. but but overall of so, course but g so my my personal view is that by showing that we have number of people that we can actually uh, we can bring them on on the roads and can sit in front of the uh, supreme court this is not the uh, answer to the solution this is not the solution to the problem actually we have to sit down and sort out the issues on the table by bringing all the stakeholders all the political parties all the political forces including establishment and pti on uh, and ppp has initiated that work uh, a few days back when the three member uh, committee of ppp they went to all the allies in the government and they uh, made them understand that you have to come on the table and then pti and pdm uh, started uh, negotiating on the table and, and most of the is, things were sorted out that process failed right those negotiations failed and subsequently um, as far as the pti is concerned and the former prime minister imran khan sahab is concerned were they dependent on him not being investigated were they dependent on him not uh, you know uh, as far as uh, you know not of course jail has always been as far as the pti is concerned uh, you know the the red line that whole slogan that has been going around is it is it was it because of that what is the overall uh, you know reason for for you know that those negotiations clearly have not worked in this case negotiation would never work out if all the stakeholders will not come on the table unconditionally mr khan was never uh, never you know uh, uh, agree to the terms that he is going to agree to the terms of the negotiation uh, going on between both the parties because khan sahab has always been taking u turns and lying lying to the people uh, and and you know currently if you look at what uh, what has been doing in uh, right now hmm. is unprecedented hmm that mr khan has been given that privilege which has never been given to anybody since for the last 23 years hmm. that anyone who have been given a pre arrest bail in the nap cases i don't see any uh, precedent in in uh, uh, in the history of pakistan Num there are a number of cases where that all the political leaders have gone through and people are facing but this has never been seen in the history and and uh, the chief justice of pakistan have been saying good to see you on the floor of the court i mean this is kind of a behavior that you can see the bias zulfikar sir let me come back courts. to you right let me come back to you ji yasir the prime minister said when he spoke today you know during the cabinet address also he talked about the nro he said that clearly this is about an nro nro was has something that, that's been recurring in in the dialogue that pti has been giving out due press process of law when we talk about as far as the government is concerned as far as the pmln also particularly is concerned they've been saying that you know when we talk about for example cases like uh, we saw the on rana sanaullah the drug case you know that has later been proven to be um, you know he's been exonerated from there has been multitude of cases as far as the leadership is concerned we look at mariam nawaz we look at uh, um, the prime minister at this time himself the former prime minister there has been numerous cases in which they have subsequently been exonerated the route that is now being taken has not been taken 
in your opinion you know my concern is what is this you know in in terms of the future of politics where is this going for the future for the future as far as your political parties and again street power the clout that they have over their people democracy peaceful protests all of those things are important but when they are used as a shield are they going to be invariably those things then that that influence uh, whether you know are, are we going to be raising untouchable politicians raising you know as in uh, you know if we have uh, if, if it's not just imran khan sir but you know there is uh, as far as like i said popularity and the amount of people that can be amassed i mean other political parties can like uh, you know can amass more people perhaps but are we going to be using them as shields in the future i think we are very much there i okay. i think um, as far as uh, what's been happening here right now but i mean if you if you think about it in a longer sort of timeline on a longer timeline you see mm. that what happened in karachi with altaf husain for example mm. that's precisely the model that is being replicated in punjab and islamabad and kp now mm. in the north of pakistan so i do see that violence political violence is going to become a bargaining tool in in our politics and that mm. that is obvious now uh i think what has happened with respect to and this is going back to something that zulfikar saab said as well mm. i i think what mr imran khan and he was actually complaining in court interestingly enough mm. he was complaining that he's been treated really badly mm. but the fact of the matter is he's actually been treated really well i mean in terms of the the kind of relief he's gotten um the the number of i mean the, the you two talked about the bail the blanket mm. bail mm. i mean this is this is un, this is unprecedented okay. and this is so clearly there are sections within and i i fear i i say this with trepidation uh there are sections within the establishment even who are still backing project imran khan as it were and mm. i i think that's why he's getting all these uh uh you know sort of privileges as it were and and uh, i i think it's going to definitely embolden his followers who are at this time or have shown at least in the last couple of days they're ready to take to streets not just peacefully but you know with arms so mm. so i think it has now become a factor yes so fula when we talk about like zulfikar saab said he said that you know coming on the table or bringing you know issues on the table and all stakeholders sitting together as a party he said that his party believes that and his party believes that that is a solution we saw as far as the election case is concerned of course that's also um, like you know 15th i think is i believe is is the, it's likely to be heard again yeah and uh, that is pending do you think that that you know we saw the the chief justice talk about sitting down and you know they but that didn't work do you think that that our process of law is going to surrender to to stakeholders sitting together Ma but it's not going to sit i mean it's not going to surrender to that when you and i are concerned uh, of course it already mm. has surrendered this is this is a clear surrender i don't i don't see any other way around it mm. uh, so we know for a fact we know for a fact that the mm. chief justice told Imran Khan that he is not an ordinary man even though the constitution says otherwise but you know the chief justice believes that Imran Khan is not an ordinary man he was told that he is to be the guest of the supreme court and stay in a special house and have his friends come over who ate at the supreme court's uh, supreme court's expense something that no prime minister has been afforded before let alone an ordinary man of course an ordinary man w w wouldn't even be found and and it's important to state here that he, the relief that was given was also a record Okay. he was given uh, he was released by the supreme court in just two days of being caught in a nap case at a time when a high court and an accountability court had already dismissed it mm. despite two dismissals the supreme court just in two days less than less than 48 hours decided that this was this is all to be done he was greeted kindly he was he was told that you know he should rest up and he was given advice on how to take care of his physical health like going out for a walk he was given advice on how to take care of his mental health by laughing and joking with his friends this is the this is the the minute degree of care that the supreme court has shown versus all the ordinary people of pakistan who are thrown into jails and the cases legit mm. cases are not mm. put up before the courts honorable courts for years and they mm. just die whilst whilst just getting vying for a chance to get a hearing 
So I am very clear on the fact. But is this a precedent for the normal man also? This will never be a precedent because the courts simply do not have that kind of ability. Even if the courts wanted to, and I and I would want to be very optimistic about it hmm. by saying that yes, from now onwards the courts will be very relief giving and the courts will continue to uh, serve others. But of course, this is not a precedent. Of course, everybody is going to have a field day with all of this. The courts may have made a mockery of this entire system by suggesting that they c he could not be arrested from the courts. I have myself witnessed Mifta Ismail getting arrested from the courts. This, uh, the courts are the one place where the police knows they can go and arrest people but because that's where they show up. But when we talk about the PTI, they talk about uh, cases like <coughs> the Haris Steel case in which I believe you know uh, the court has precedent. So there is the Musa Gilani's case, right, mm. in which the court stated and the court gave mention of one case in which he said that the Musa Gilani was coming to surrender mm. himself, mm. but why did you arrest him? Mm. Well, yes, he was coming to surrender himself for that very case. In Imran Khan's case, he was arrested in a different case. Mm. And that is what happens with habitual criminals. Mm. Uh, let's, let's leave aside Imran Khan because I mm. think this might leave, uh, mm. this might create a problem. Mm. But let's say there is a criminal who has mm. hundreds of FIRs against him. Mm. Once again, although Imran Khan has two, but mm. uh, we'll just treat him as a special entity. If uh, a criminal has hundreds of entity, mm. uh, hundreds of uh, offenses against him, mm. the police usually arrest them mm. from district from courts, the court, from okay. the courts, and the reason mm. why they do so is because they know that's the only place where they'll find them. Habitual mm. criminals are always on the run. Mm. Now, in Imran Khan's case, the police did try to go to his house earlier in Zaman Park, and just a little while earlier, you and I were sitting discussing what happened in Zaman Park. Mm. So, what what is the police supposed to do? What is the what are the law agencies supposed to do? They can't go to his house. They can't go to the court. Uh, are they supposed to ram into his car whilst he's traveling from in between his house to the courts? Mm. Is, is that what they're supposed to do uh, whilst he's going on his bulletproof cars? By the way, once again, even now, a bulletproof car was given to him by the Supreme Court, uh, BMW at uh, that. But you know, that's, that's what's funny. What, what is the law enforcement agency supposed to do? Mm. And I applaud the government for one thing. Since, since we have come to a complete head-on collision, the Supreme Court has clearly shown its bias. They penalize the government even for debating a law in the parliament. They mm. can't even discuss that. We have, we, have, mm. we, have, we have seen examples of that as well. And yet, the government continues to give effect to the Supreme Court's judgments. Because mind you, the Supreme Court does not have a police or an army. They only have the government to rely on to enforce their judgments. When yesterday they said, take him to the police line's guest house, it was still the government which took him. It was not the Supreme Court themselves. And bring him back. Within and bring him back. An and hour, all of this was still back. done. And yeah. his menu at the night was still mm. served by the government. Mm. And the government continues to obey Supreme Court orders. Whereas the Supreme Court is not allowing even the government to conduct its basic functions like discuss a law. Mm. So of course, of course, we do see a big problem. And I don't understand um, what the next steps could be for the government. Um, mm. If if we were, if I were for instance the legal mm. advisor to Shabazz Sharif, I would be stumped. I would not know because anything he would do, the, the Supreme Court would just nullify immediately. And he, even even to think even I, tomorrow I could I could expect a judgment which says you can't even consult your legal advisor. You know that's illegal. Why did you talk to? Let me go to Zulfikar <laughs> Sahib. Zulfikar Sahib, we saw the Prime Minister speak. We saw your leader also, uh, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, talk about when the courts are angling towards a certain outcome. This, you are talking about sitting together, you're talking about, it doesn't look like the former prime minister is willing at this time, even after what all has happened or transpired, he's still accusing. He's still sitting in court after he was granted a blanket bail, accusing, uh, you know, state heads. He's accusing, uh, of course, the government is also accusing state institutions at this time. How will the government deal with that, in your opinion? I want to take you back at uh, Mr. Bilawal Bhutto Zardari on the floor of the uh, house. Asked the Prime Minister at that time that you must register a case against the Deputy Speaker and President of Pakistan when they violated the Constitution. So uh, he also raised the point when any of the judges, honorable judges of the Supreme Court, when they violate the constitution, where should we go? Where is the place that, that we all go and uh, you know raise a question or complain against those judges? So this is the point, you see. When this kind of a scenario comes in the nation, we have mm -hmm we have no place to go so we have to sit down and sort out the issues 
but mr khan even when he was the prime minister back when he became the prime minister back in 2018 mm. mr bilawal bhutto zardari and mr rasif ali zardari and at that time even the opposition leader mr shabash sharif also gave him unconditional support but he never wanted to sit with them he was ready to sit with the uh, taliban but he he is again when he is out of power he is not ready to sit with the people who is in the power so the thing is actually his mindset is very different we have to think about one thing which is very serious and But all the stakeholders all the his mindset is unfortunately or fortunately what you are stuck with right yeah so what i am saying is all the forces who have become stronger than the state the state has to come the cut them down to the size that they become shorter than the state hmm. cause otherwise these forces you see uh, 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 imran khan sahab was energized by the chief justice of pakistan that hmm. i know you don't like your opponents go and uh, talk to your opponents but uh, do whatever you want to he has been given a vvip treatment i mean when this kind of treatment is given to such a leader so he will never come on the table he will never come unconditionally and talk things out for the sake of country and he will want to go and ask the people to go and do some kind of terrorism in the country which they have done in the last couple of days right fair enough i mean yes, where are we heading had- there's you know there's talk about banning when you talk about banning political parties of course the government has also you know said that they are not talking about banning any particular party at this time but of course in the past we have parties which have been declared uh, you know terrorist mm-hmm. organizations in your opinion you know when you take uh, going down that route what will that entail that has its own ramifications for the political process isn't it true I believe that first of all let me start by saying that of course nobody wants to ban a political party mm. that's absolutely the last option mm. right i mean mm. that's and something and we've had the government say that and and that's mm. what that's what the government's been saying all mm. along mm. that's not something that anyone wants to do however if a political party is constantly violating uh its constitutional responsibility mm. there's a constitutional responsibility to uh and and there's there's obviously you know the whole idea of obedience to the constitution mm. if the party ceases to be obedient to the constitution mm. if the party refuses to abide by the law then it immediately does become a proscribed or can be a proscribed organization mm. because it has violated the law enough times for it to merit such a such a categorization so i i feel that yes uh this is something that again you know like the government says it's not mm. going to do mm. or it is not thinking mm. about doing but mm. it's something that needs to be considered seriously if mm. the kind of violence that we've seen mm. happening on may 9th and so on uh if that gets repeated i think the state has to put its foot down of course and we are at this time you know looking at uh, bo- as far as the pti itself is concerned it's saying that you know that's not really of course investigation is in process and we will know who and what those elements are whichever you know as far as responsible for violence that we saw responsible for you know creating the kind of havoc that we uh, witnessed in the last couple of days so if you look moving on towards other cases of the former prime minister how is this going to work for investigating him in those other cases because once the cases are registered they have to be investigated of right? course and so and so we have already seen the high court give him a blanket bail mm-hmm. in all cases which is mm-hmm. something that i'm not even aware is in the high court's power by the way i i'm i'm not aware if the high court can do that i want to you know, yes i, I, would, want, I want to go into the legality of that yeah. how how has it happened before how does I it i i i can't imagine um, mm-hmm. this being the case the high court mm-hmm. has the power to give adjudicate upon a case that is before it but how can it adjudicate upon a case that's not even before it so i'm i'm not even understanding and for the future also for the future said. and the how how do they know what's going to happen in the future if imran khan were to go and commit murder right now what uh, are we just supposed to go and sit there would that blanket ban still hold of course hold? because that's what the high court has said and mm. you know in all its wisdom i don't understand uh, how these things happen 
And of course, when we talk about uh, proscribed organizations, when we talk about uh, blacklisting a party, it needs to merit uh, the the uh, something big must have happened. And in the past, we have seen only two other parties having attacked the GHQ and or or, 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 or core commander's house. Uh, they were TTP and BLA. We are very happy to categorize them as terrorist organizations, proscribed organizations. I don't want this for BTI myself, simply mm -hmm. because I know they are much bigger. But uh, the actions are, of course, the same. The, there is no discernible difference between what has happened as far as the act of it is concerned. And if PTI was much smaller, perhaps it would be a proscribed organization. I, mm. you know, we, we, don't, we don't know that yet. That said, Manoj, I am simply at a loss here because I don't understand, to date, I don't understand what the stance of PTI is. Mm. So even when we talk about these mass protests mm. and these protests mm. by the uh, mm. by the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf are mm. being presented as protests for rights, mm. what rights are they asking for? Mm. What is this right that they ask for? What, mm. what constitutional amendment? Can, if I was to word it, if I was to ask as a single person, can you please write down what it is that you want, that the government is not granting you, mm. can you they, they would not be able to. They okay. would sim simply say, why did you arrest our leader? Well, he was arrested because you know, the due process of law was being followed. No, we don't want that. All, all that they seem to want is that their leader be declared untouchable. Okay. And the Supreme Court has done that. The Supreme Court has come through. So we now know for a fact that everybody is not equal before the law in Pakistan. The so Supreme Court has given its assent to it. And that's fine. I think this is the new reality that Pakistanis mm -hmm. will have to live with. I, I don't see any other way since the Apex Court has decided that this is this is the law of the uh, you know land now. Hmm. So it, and it's unfortunate, of course. That you think that there will be, a, you know, perhaps jurisprudence on this, on yeah. how uh, the former Prime Minister Imran Khan can be investigated. Well, I, I think uh, I'm sorry to sort gee, of gee, add, gee, to, he, add to this. To I think one of the things that has happened, the way the the case was taken up in the Supreme Court, it doesn't make any sense. I okay. mean, what uh, there had to be an ICA, which hmm. is yeah. an intra court appeal. Hmm. It should have been filed against the order that. Uh, the uh, the chief justice of the Islamabad High Court and had there was given. an objection and there was an objection and that objection was overruled. Hmm. So how is it that that ICA process was, you know, sort of sidestepped altogether? Hmm. Now that not just that, but if you look at the Supreme Court's order, it talks hmm. about an it says it talks about a writ petition and a foresaid writ petition. It says again, hmm. this. I haven't been able to figure out which writ petition they're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Mm. So it's there's a lot of confusion in the way this entire thing has actually transpired. I think that, uh, and I'm I'm again, you know, I've been using the word trepidation. Mm. Um, I feel that there is the division in 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 our sort of not just the judiciary but also the establishment is so deep seated at this time that we are seeing this as a manifestation of that. There is a section within our establishment. And but Yasser, are those questions relevant? Are those questions relevant today? The question should just be that the Supreme Court has to enforce the rule of law. And they have to act within their jurisdiction to do so. All our you know, agencies, as far as NAB is concerned, as far as investigative agencies are concerned, you know, at, at the outset, that process of law should be followed and that should be the only thing that should matter what political affiliations are what is happening under you know what is what is the establishment thinking what is those considerations should certainly not figure in the investigative process ideally for anyone. It shouldn't. yeah ideally it shouldn't hmm. however unfortunately this is what this is the way in pakistan unfortunately and, and yeah. this is uh, this is something that i say uh, as a Pakistani who's actually troubled by this, mm. the fact that this is what goes in Pakistan, and it doesn't it it, it doesn't mm. look like it's going to change anytime soon, unfortunately. I'll, why I'll actually add to sorry. I have to go to Zulfiqar yeah, sir, but gee, uh, uh, why doesn't the court order a ban on on the former prime minister amassing people outside, for example? Can it be done? I'm sure it has been in the past. I I would imagine that doing that would be. So then again, the question of peaceable, peaceful assembly, assembly and, comes and, and up. And right. And again, it's when they break the law, that's when it becomes a problem. Mm. But they have. So therefore, it goes back to the question of whether such an organization should be prescribed or not. I believe, like Barrister Safiullah said, 
that given that BLA also blew up Zarat residency and you know the court commander's house in Lahore was Mr. Jinnah's uh, residence. Mm. Uh, I think uh, that's a parallel and then you have the parallel of the attack on GHQ mm. with TTP. Mm. So if TTP and BLA are banned as proscribed organizations, mm. then surely PTI also deserves that. A mm. At least that's what, you know, it would work. Fair play, I would suggest. Jee, Zulfikar, uh, Zulfikar sahab, uh, overall, as far as now, now the options for the government are concerned, are you going to move forward? Like you said, are you going to now try again for there to be talks? Unmute yourself, please. You're muted. Jee. I want to add uh, what my learner what my learned brothers were saying that Mr. Yes. Khan has got so many bails in so many FIS, but have any any of the judges, any of the courts have asked him, have you uh, joined any of the investigations? It's just that they are stressed, they are stressing on giving him the bail, pre rest bails, protective bails, but they are not pushing him or asking him to join the investigation. Uh, again, this is uh, very unprecedented. Because I have been going into so many cases where the judge gives one or two times or, and they ask the accused person to join the investigation. I don't know why Mr. Khan has not been asked. Again, uh, same thing what one of my learned brothers said. Uh, he has become untouchable and Supreme mm -hmm. Court has given that assent. Right, fair enough. Coming to your question, why can't coming you know, as, to as your coming to your question, G. I'm I'm saying that you I know, let me just interject here. Why can't? What is the urgency, in your opinion, as far as the former prime minister is concerned? You know, of course, there was an urgency to dissolve the assemblies, then you know the the the, the election also, and to have them before uh, the term of uh, the the government uh, uh, exhausts itself, is. Why is there that urgency in your opinion? Mr. Khan is a politically immature person. He has never worked in his life. He has never done job. He has never done business. He has been getting advices from the people and he has to look for his own interest. And he did us and uh, took a politically immature decision. Now he mm -hmm. is regretting it and all the parties are you know, all the party leaders are saying that it shouldn't have been uh, what you said and taken of the assemblies of the hook, you know. Hmm. Fair enough. So, Jee, um, so, Jee Karsa, please continue. I, I just want to, what the reason you were asking about that the government, government can always sit down and look for an option, but go government cannot, you know, let the people take, uh, you know, law rate of the government and, yeah, and rate of the government and take the law into their own hands. Because this mm -hmm. is a very crucial movement. Pakistan standing at a crossroad and the state of the government have to decide whether they have to take and set an example of these people who are, you know, doing a terrorist acts or just let it go like that. So, right, fair enough. Gee, Zafula, you wanted to say something. Unfortunately, I have to close. I'm running out of time. Gee. I was I was going to comment on the manner in which the Supreme Court uh, decided to give its judgment on the matter. Normally, mm. it's uh, if there is an appeal, they usually talk about the writ petition. They mm. give a reference. They mm. talk about where the judge has erred. Mm. No such thing was done. I also want to uh, highlight the fact that... You're saying that it's yeah. a huge deviation from normal procedure in this case. That, Absolutely. apart from the fact that, you know, the the cause list of that day had just that one case, uh, specially made bench just for this, you know, a lot of, lot of other things that suggest that there was a high degree of malice and malified involved. Mm. But, you know, we, we can't talk about these things. Right, right? fair enough. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Of course, you know, the last few days, the events of last few days, leave a lot to think about overall as far again, like the writ of the government is concerned and whether their primary responsibility in this case is to enforce that uh, and to ensure that due process of law takes place, to ensure the investigations pursuant to law do happen, regardless of who is being investigated. As a leader, of course, if uh, the former prime minister chose or chose 
I, I believe, you know, to, to surrender to law in a manner befitting perhaps his leadership status. Um, would, would, his, uh, would his status as a leader of a political party be reduced significantly? What is there to be afraid of when we talk about this urgency as far as the electoral process is concerned? Now that, practically speaking, a little bit, you know, a few perhaps uh, months are left in uh, the, the overall term of the government is concerned, are these hasty decisions that have eventually, that will eventually cost the PTI itself and its leadership, all of those are questions perhaps to be pondered. Thank you so much for joining us today on this.